Thank you for being here and for your interest in metals. Every year, the world produces about 2 billion tons of steel, enough to build nearly 40,000 skyscrapers the size of the Empire State Building. The phone in your hand, the car you drive, even the clean energy grid we hope to build, all depend on metals. They're the quiet enablers of modern civilization. This presentation is based on our recent paper published in Nature, cited on the slide if you'd like to explore the full analysis. In that work, we describe a threefold challenge that's reshaping the global metals industry. Growing scarcity of key resources, surging demand, and high greenhouse gas emissions from production. Over the next few minutes, I'll walk through these challenges and then outline a five-part strategy for building a metals future that is both sustainable and secure. I'd love to hear your questions and comments below on this page because these challenges and how we solve them affect all of us and the generations to come. This slide outlines what we'll cover today. We'll start by unpacking the three problems at the heart of this crisis, what we call the triple threat. First, scarcity. Known reserves of several critical metals, copper, nickel, chromium, may last only a few more decades at current consumption rates. This isn't a distant concern. It's within the careers of today's young professionals. Second, demand. As populations grow and technologies like electric vehicles, renewable energy, and advanced computing expand, the need for metals is skyrocketing. By 2050, demand for key elements like zinc, lead, and copper is projected to outpace what we can currently supply. And third, emissions. Metal production is one of the most carbon-intensive activities on the planet. Steelmaking alone produces about 8% of global CO2 emissions, more than three times the entire aviation sector. Aluminum and copper add hundreds of millions of tons more toxic gases. These three pressures, scarcity, rising demand, and high emissions are deeply intertwined. Together, they define the scale of the challenge and the urgency for change. And next, we'll turn to the most important question. What can we do now to address this triple challenge? After we examine the nature of the challenges, we will review the five strategies in detail that we need to implement to address these challenges. Let's look at what we call the first pressure point, scarcity. The figure you see here comes directly from our nature paper. It shows that the known reserves of essential metals like copper, nickel, and chromium could be exhausted within just a few decades if we continue at today's rate of consumption. What's striking is that these are not distant, abstract projections. They fall well within the professional lifetimes of engineers entering the workforce today. Even more concerning, new mineral discoveries are slowing down while global demand keeps accelerating. So, the message is clear. Reserves aren't forever, and our only sustainable path forward is to design systems that reuse materials and drastically improve efficiency. Now, let's look at the second part of the problem, the explosion in global demand. Every clean energy project, every electric vehicle, every data center, they all rely on metals. What's striking is how fast this demand is growing. The data from our study show that for key elements like zinc, lead, and copper, demand could exceed known reserves by around 2050. So even as we celebrate the shift to a low-carbon economy, we're intensifying pressure on the very resources that make that transition possible. This is not just an economic challenge, it's a sustainability dilemma we must confront head-on. But there's another side to this story. The way we produce metals today carries a massive environmental price tag. Steelmaking alone accounts for about 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions. That's 3.6 billion tons every year, more than three times what aviation contributes. So the challenge isn't just meeting demand, it's doing so without intensifying the climate crisis unless we change how we extract and process metals. Solving one global problem could make another far worse. Let's start with the first strategy, 
swapping materials. Sometimes even a tiny change in composition can make a huge difference. Take steel, for example. We use about a billion tons of carbon manganese steel every year for buildings and infrastructure. But if we add just a trace amount, about 0.03% of niobium, the steel becomes much stronger and tougher. Because it's stronger, we need less of it, and that means roughly 20% lower carbon dioxide emissions for the same structure. This principle extends beyond steel. Researchers are developing iron nitride magnets to replace rare earth magnets, sodium ion batteries to avoid lithium shortages, and even thermal batteries made from materials as simple as crushed rock or cement. To make this shift real, governments and industry need to reward low emission materials, universities must teach substitution principles, and collaboration between academia and industry has to accelerate innovation. The message here is, smart substitutions don't just save resources, they reshape entire industries towards sustainability. Our second strategy focuses on adopting green technologies. The metals industry urgently needs to shrink its environmental footprint. Take aluminum. Its production emits about 270 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, roughly one-tenth that of steel. It also releases fluorine compounds that are far more toxic than carbon dioxide. Copper smelting, on the other hand, produces massive amounts of sulfur dioxide, a major cause of acid rain. The good news is that we already have technologies that can help. For example, in steelmaking, top gas recycling blast furnaces can reuse carbon dioxide from the process itself, cutting emissions dramatically. In copper smelting, Sulfur dioxide can be captured and converted into sulfuric acid instead of being released into the atmosphere. Even more exciting are biological approaches, hydrometallurgy and bioleaching, where microbes extract metals from low-grade ores or even from electronic waste, avoiding the energy-intensive smelting step entirely. So, the science is ready. The challenge is adoption. Many of these solutions remain underused simply because of cost. That's where government incentives, carbon pricing, and low-interest green loans come in. Just as policy helped solar energy take off, the same approach can accelerate cleaner metal production. Another powerful way to cut down our use of metals is by going circular. That means designing products that last longer, can be repaired easily, and are fully recyclable. Companies like Apple and Dell are already showing that this approach works through their certified refurbishment programs. Governments also play a big role. The European Union's Circular Economy Action Plan and Eco Design Directive are great examples. Setting standards for durability and repairability. But we need to go further. Metals like nickel, cobalt, and rare earths still have very low recycling rates. Urban mining and advanced sorting technologies can help recover these from electronic waste, and manufacturing itself can change. 3D printing, for instance, minimizes waste by using only the exact amount of metal needed. If we combine smarter design, better recycling, and innovative manufacturing, we can build a truly circular and sustainable metal economy. As global demand for metals rises and geopolitical tensions continue to shape supply routes, building resilient supply chains has become essential. The idea is simple. We need to ensure long-term access to key materials while reducing vulnerability to disruption. There are two major strategies here, strategic stockpiling and source diversification. For example, the United States maintains a national defense stockpile of critical metals and has invested over $400 million since 2020 to strengthen domestic rare earth production and refining. Similarly, the European Raw Materials Alliance is working to secure critical materials for EU industries. But resilience also means responsibility. Many metals come from regions affected by conflict or poor labor conditions. That's why the conflict minerals regulations in the US and EU require companies to trace sources of elements like tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold. 
Beyond these national efforts, there are international initiatives, such as the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance and the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, both aimed at improving ethical, environmental, and governance standards in mining. However, most of these programs depend on voluntary participation, and that's a key limitation. If we want real accountability, we need binding international frameworks, similar to the Montreal Protocol, which successfully phased out ozone-depleting chemicals through enforceable targets and global cooperation. So to truly build resilient and ethical metal supply chains, we need that same level of global commitment, not just good intentions, but real action and accountability. The future of our metals and mining industry comes down to one simple truth. Invest in people or risk falling behind. We need skilled geologists, engineers, and metallurgists, professionals who can extract resources efficiently, responsibly, and sustainably. And the clock is ticking. By 2030, to meet the Paris Agreement goal of a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, the industry will need 700,000 new workers, almost double today's workforce. But this isn't just about numbers. We're facing a perfect storm rapid technological change, mass retirements, and declining retention rates. In the EU alone, 3.5 million positions may open by 2035. The skills needed are evolving faster than ever. Automation, connected devices, and big data analytics aren't optional. They're essential. Companies must train their current workforce and attract fresh talent, while governments provide incentives and universities ensure graduates are ready for the real-world challenges of today and tomorrow. Here's the key. No single action will solve this alone. Each organization must prioritize what works best for them. But together, these strategies will revitalize the metals industry, protect our environment, and build a truly sustainable society. Remember this. People are the resource that will unlock all other resources. Invest in them wisely, and the future is bright. Ignore them, and we risk falling behind. To tackle metal scarcity, rising demand, and greenhouse gas emissions, there are five key strategies, each with its strengths and challenges. First, swapping materials. By substituting scarce metals, we reduce both resource pressure and emissions. It's effective but it requires significant research, resources, and time. Second, adopting green technologies. This can dramatically cut emissions and must be a top priority. The challenge, high costs, slow implementation, and limited access in poorer regions. Third, going circular. Recycling and reusing metals can ease scarcity and demand pressures. Emission benefits are indirect, but still meaningful. Fourth, diversifying supply chains. This improves resilience to shortages and demand spikes. However, policy development is slow, and success depends on socioeconomic conditions. Finally, investing in people, strengthening workforce skills is essential to support sustainable mining and manufacturing. While its immediate impact is lower than technology-focused strategies, it enables all other approaches. Together, these strategies form a toolkit. No single solution is enough, but when combined, they can help us secure resources, meet demand sustainably, and reduce environmental impact. The metals supply chain faces three urgent challenges, scarcity, rising demand, and climate impact. The time to act is now, by swapping smarter, going greener, thinking circular, diversifying supply chains, and investing in people. Industry, government, and academia must join forces to turn these strategies into action. Together, these efforts can revitalize the metals industry, protect the planet, and build a sustainable future for all.